Hello, I'm uh, Terry Kramer, and I'm the faculty director at the Easton Technology Management Center here at UCLA Anderson. And I'd like to welcome all of you to this webinar on technology-based disruptions and the leadership imperatives in what is a rapidly changing environment. And I'd like to just first start out and thank our partners in organizing this event, uh, the UCLA Anderson Alumni Network, and a special welcome to quite a few alums that are on this webinar, as well as some current students. So let me just launch in, uh, first of all, to say that it, it's no understatement to say that technology is radically changing the world around us in terms of the products and services that we experience, in terms of the companies that we see forming, and in terms of the society that, that we live in broadly. And a lot of this is due to the impact and maturity of several enabling technologies. Things like cloud computing, which allow us to access information on the spot. Things like fifth generation mobile networks, super high speed networks that give us access to very high data rates and capacity. Uh, things like the internet of things, the idea that almost everything will be connected at one point in the future ourselves, buildings, cars, et cetera, and literally the growth of hundreds of millions of connected devices every single year. And then ultimately artificial intelligence and data. So the ability to glean insights from data that is forming new products, new services, and new insights. Now all of this is adding up to transformational products and services, whether this is in areas like e-commerce, or social networks, or autonomous vehicles, uh, diagnostic tools in areas like healthcare, they're transformational products. All along the way, there are new companies being created. There's continued growth of huge technology companies like Google and Amazon and Microsoft, but also we see disruptions of existing companies and industries across almost every single sector. On top of all of these changes, we have the impact of COVID-19 and the impact of the coronavirus on how we're living our lives, how we're gonna use technology, how it's gonna change the plight of industries, uh, et cetera. Now to talk about these fascinating uh, issues, we have got a great panel of three very accomplished Anderson uh, alums. Mark Thomas, who is the group product manager at SNAP. We have Peter Trepp, who's with us, who's the CEO and president of Face First, which is a recognition software company focused on facial recognition, et cetera. And we have uh, Lori Vanderloo, who is an executive from financial services, fintech payments, including companies such as uh, Visa. Now, in terms of the format for our um, a session today. I'm going to ask the panelists a series of questions um, and then we'll open it up to audience Q&A. For the audience Q&A, we're going to use Slido. So just on any of the devices you're using today, enter in Slido, S-L-I-D-O.com. It'll ask for an event code. You'll enter in L-I-R-C-E. So an abbreviation of this event. So leadership imperatives in a rapidly changing environment. So L-I-R-C-E, you can either enter in your own question or you can upvote an existing one. And I will endeavor to uh, ask as many of the most popular questions as, um, as possible. So let me start out with our panelists here. Um, and I just wanna have you just briefly introduce yourselves and tell us about your journey since uh, Anderson and, and what you've been doing and what you're doing uh, today. Mark, you wanna start? Sure thing, thanks Terry, and uh, great to be here. Thanks everyone for joining us. So again, my name is Mark Thomas. Uh, I graduated uh, technically in 2010. I was a dual degree uh, MBA, master's in computer science student at Anderson. And uh, since then, I was a product manager at Google for many years, for eight years uh, after that. And then I recently took on a role at Snapchat, as uh, Terry mentioned, leading up a product management group focused on insights in ad experimentation. Uh, I'm also teaching a class uh, right now on product management at Anderson. Uh, so getting, it's great to get uh, connected back into the community this, this way. Excellent. Thanks, Mark. Peter? 
Barry, thank you very much. And it's nice to see everybody. Thank you all for, for joining us today. Um, I uh, graduated in 1998. Uh, I was a FEMBA and in fact, I uh, met my wife in, at school. We were in the same class together. And um, I have spent my, my uh, post Anderson years uh, mostly involved in technology. Uh, I was an investment banker for a little while and worked on a, a number of uh, uh, tech deals. And then I sort of steered my career down the path of, of working for software companies, mostly enterprise and SaaS software companies and um, found myself here at Face First about uh, three years ago. Uh, I am on sort of the lecture circuit at, uh, at Anderson these days and enjoy spending time in, in, in classrooms and, and chatting with the, uh, the new students. So thank you very much for, for, uh, for being here. Excellent, thanks Peter. Lori? Great, hi, I'm Lori Vandaloo and uh, I am also um, a member of the class of 1998. Um, I was part of the full-time program, and um, uh, my uh, actually, I was one of the, uh, I guess, three married-in-the-program couples, so my husband, uh, P.K. Vandaloo, was also class of 1998. Um, since, uh, since graduating, I focused my career primarily in, the, in, in kind of three areas, product marketing and innovation. Um, but I've also done uh, a, a lot of additional work sort of either in parallel or sort of on and off, um, you know, through taking uh, line jobs and working in strategy and business operation roles, including a couple of stints as a chief of staff or executive chief of staff for, uh, for various organizations. Um, I initially spent a few years with Accenture Strategic Services practice straight out of school. And that was followed by about five or six years in mobile and technology companies. And then as Terry had mentioned, I really spent a significant amount of my time in kind of the global payments and financial technology or FinTech area, including almost nine years in various leadership roles at Visa. I also spent a couple of years uh, where I founded a FinTech video banking um, SaaS service. And most recently, I created a global payments and fintech innovation course, which I've been teaching here at Anderson uh, as part of the Easton program, working with, with uh, Terry and Mark. Excellent. Good. Thank you, Lori. Let me start out to, with each of you. Obviously, kind of the topic of today and probably the year and the decade is going to be the coronavirus and the impact that it has on all of us. And it'd be great if each of you would just give us briefly what your view of the impact of it, of it is on you, on your organizations, and then broadly society. How is it can kind of affect who we are and what we do, et cetera? And then I wanna drill down on, uh, on that. Lori, why don't we start with you? Yeah, sure. So, you know, for, for me, um, I was teaching actually last quarter. So I was teaching my global payments and fintech innovation course in winter. And so the impact for me was really very similar to that uh, as experienced by the rest of Anderson and the broader UCLA community. Um, the administration and Anderson uh, leadership went from like zero to 100 percent in less than 24 hours. It was really um, you know, a pretty phenomenal experience to be part of. Um, the Anderson community really mobilized quickly. We um, luckily had the technology infrastructure already in place. Many of us were already um, uh, using, you know, many aspects of video, things like Slido, online meetings, um, you know, as we conducted our courses or breakout sessions. So it was a pretty smooth transition. Um, it was actually, um, you know, literally like got the, got the messages at about midnight and, you know, we were, we were fully, um, you know, operating by my class at, at four o'clock the next day. So, um, you know, technical teams came together um, uh, along with the professors and uh, we also hosted, you know, a series of webinars and hands-on sessions. So we didn't just stop at just kind of making the technology available, but really, you know, um, sort of catalyzed a series of webinars within the um, sort of the, the, the group of instructors to sort of, you know, sort of teach the teachers and, and share different frameworks for what works in, in trying to teach an, an approach that's online, how to host a, and conduct a case discussion online, how to do a breakout session via, via Zoom or some other uh, remote training. So those were some of the things that we experienced. Excellent. Excellent. Peter, your thoughts? So, you know, we're uh, uh, an enterprise grade uh, identity software company. 
Um, so we provide, you know, some pretty large scale identity solutions to, to, to big companies. And, and, uh, and our uh, customers are almost across the board, consumer facing industries. So retail, uh, travel, um, uh, a variety of industries that where you know consumers are, are are very involved. So so of course our business has changed pretty dramatically, and we see you know new um, uh, kinds of categories for consumer facing industries that we really didn't think about before. Essential versus non essential uh, businesses, as an example. Now before COVID nineteen, I would say you know, travel and hospitality is a pretty essential business, but it's all but shut down these days. So essential is maybe not quite the right word for it, but, but certainly we've all seen these kind of divisions. And so from our standpoint, we've established kind of a war room approach to how we're dealing with customers because a number of our customers have either closed the doors temporarily um, or, you know, business has slowed significantly, while other of our customers are extremely busy right now and have all kinds of needs and are coming to us with very specific um, you know, requests. So on, on balance, I think we're finding ourselves um, busier and, and I think some of the things that we were working on pre-COVID uh, have gained a sense of urgency uh, and, and we're, we're seeing lots of, of things kind of coming at us even faster these days. So it, it's kind of an exciting time and we're still, you know, rooting for the rest of, of these businesses to hopefully, you know, regain some traction and get, get you know, going again. Yep. Great. Mark? Yeah. Uh, so, Terry, I'll, I'll start by answering from a personal perspective. Uh, how has this affected me and, and my family? I would say, uh, you know, but my life has actually not changed that much, <laughs> which is kind of sad. Uh, we have a four and a half year old, so we gave up meeting up with friends and going out and having fun about four and a half years ago. And so now we're just really focused on our family, which is really nice. Um, but I think also the nature of the business that I work in, so technology, internet tech, I, I was on video conferences most of the time, all the time, every day. I was essentially working remote at least half of my day anyway. So the move to work from home and, and all that has actually not that been that big of a difference. Uh, other than I now have two more hours worth of work since I don't have to drive on LA streets. Um, so, and, and for Snapchat, uh, if you've been following it at all, uh, this has, you know, like many of the tech companies, we've seen a, a tremendous boost uh, from this. We have, you know, our, our core user base is between 13 and 20, 25. And uh, you've got a bunch of bored uh, high school and, and college students that can't go see their friends with the platform they use to talk with their friends uh, readily at their disposal. So just everything that, that, um, that we provide is being used more. Uh, and I think one of the, maybe the, the generalizable side effects of that is that the corners of our service that maybe were not particularly, they're sort of on the margins um, are now being elevated uh, and are becoming a lot more sort of front and center. So you could take, for example, we have a, a content business. You can kind of think of it like a Netflix on one side of our app uh, where we provide shows and, and TV shows and, and other types of content, that has seen a huge uptick in, in um, usage. We also provide games, which you know, prior to uh, COVID was sort of like a, it was nice to have feature. It's now something that is used very heavily. Um, and I think maybe the, the broader theme here is that you're gonna start seeing, I think, these technologies that maybe have existed kind of on the margins for a while being thrust into uh, sort of the, the, the limelight or the, the, the spotlight uh, in a way that's going to test them out. And I think what you might see uh, for some of these, uh, you might see that there was some unrealized value there, that they were being held back a little bit, um, maybe because they were on the corner. Maybe we find out that actually games should be front and center in Snap, for example. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's kind of one of the things that, that we're grappling with. Good. And let me ask you, Mark, and I'm going to ask each of you, if you were to look into the next two, three, four years and say, what does the new normal look like for industries? And I'm going to ask you your top two or three industries or products that you think are going to do better in COVID-19, and then two or three industries, companies, products that are going to do worse in this environment. And Warren Buffett just you know, made an announcement. He's pulled out of uh, all of his airline investments because he thinks it's going to be a long time before the airlines uh, ever, ever recover. As an example, tell me your top two or three 
plays on the positive side and the ones you would get out of? Uh, Mark? Tech and tech. <laughs> okay. Those are my top two. I, I, you know, the, the, I, and I think large tech it, are really, there's, there's no way that Google, Facebook, and Amazon don't come out winning. Uh, there's, there's just, um, they're so well positioned to benefit and sort of scoop up a lot of um, the, the, maybe, I think there's going to be more opportunity for them coming out of this. Uh, and I think the general theme I'm seeing with COVID is that it's really just accelerated a lot of trends that were already in motion here. So it, when I think about uh, industries that, that have been struggling, uh, they're going to, those are the ones that I think you're going to see a lot of, of change in. So small business, I think, is going to get hammered by this. Uh, and I think you can kind of look at um, Facebook and Google have both committed hundreds of millions, almost a billion dollars in aid to small businesses. Um, on the one hand, that, that is very generous. On the other hand, they're definitely sniffing for what's gonna survive. And, and trying, this is now a ploy, I think, in a lot of ways to develop loyalty and sort of identify who's gonna be the survival from, from the uh, mm -hmm. uh, small businesses. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think small businesses are gonna struggle. I think um, another one is retail. Uh, traditional retail is going to struggle very much. Uh, and specifically, I think there are a lot of retailers uh, the ones that have developed an omni-channel uh, sales strategy, ones that have already had some form of selling outside of their physical stores are going to be better positioned to survive this. The ones that don't or are still very early stage are going to struggle a lot. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, Laura, your views? Yeah, um, I, I think kind of to build on some of the things that Mark has said, um, you know, I spend, uh, you know, most of my time thinking about payments, um, you know, related fintech or adjacent areas and commerce, really. And, um, you know, one of the, the, the biggest opportunities I see is just the continued acceleration, uh, continued move of electronic payments broadly, but really the acceleration of those businesses. Um, so again, like Mark was saying, I mean, it's, it's things that, that were already in motion, um, but it really just kind of helps take it to the next level. And um, in particular, I see this in a couple of areas. Um, one is uh, e-commerce, which I think you mentioned at the beginning. I'll talk a little more about that and um, uh, the idea of contactless. And it's kind of interesting. I know we were having a, a chat about this uh, um, uh, the other day, but contactless as an overall value proposition has really become a key theme um, and has really taken hold as kind of the marketing stamp of the COVID pandemic, you know, if you think about it. But for payments, you know, when we talk about contactless, um, it was typically in reference to the contactless technology relating to the chip in physical cards, um, you know, or that stored in, in the secure element of a digital wallet, such as an Apple Pay or a G Pay. Um, and so, um, you know, really seeing kind of the, the uptick of that. And then, you know, in the most recent, um, you know, quarterly earnings, I think in the last week, you know, uh, Visa, MasterCard, American Express, if you look at all of their, their uh, earnings transcripts, you'll see, you know, contactless front and center um, and, and really what that's been doing. I mean, I think they've been seeing, you know, both MasterCard and Visa reported, you know, uh, double digit, um, you know, increases of contactless use in, in all areas. Um, I think MasterCard reported like 40% increase due to, uh, you know, the current environment, um, you know, and seeing, you know, areas where you just, you know, didn't necessarily, um, you know, have, have use of card before, you're seeing more issuance of contactless cards. And, you know, really the, the big push to kind of move from cash and check to, you know, digital forms of payment. Um, and if you kind of compare this to, um, you know, maybe like the early 2000s, what, China, what happened in China with SARS, you know, you saw a big move to e-commerce and, you know, what has now become kind of mobile commerce. And a lot of that infrastructure was really laid and, and really kind of the catalyst for moving so quickly and, and really kind of hitting that tipping point, you know, was their, uh, you know, their pandemic, you know, back almost 20 years ago. And so you can see a lot of similarities between the two. So I think, you know, if I had to pick an area, I would continue to stay right where I am, uh, which is in payments um, and, you know, really looking at how you double down on, you know, increasing, um, you know, access to, 
you know, getting more either, you know, cards or accounts, uh, you know, into the hands of consumers, accounts into businesses, um, and then looking at, um, you know, because you have to really kind of mobilize the entire ecosystem, it would also be looking at, you know, how do you mobilize, you know, more um, retail locations to accept contactless and upgrading their terminals, um, you know, or if I'm, uh, you know, going to be, you know, focusing on those who are pushing digital wallets, you know, how you can get, you know, greater, greater awareness and trial of those so that people can get more comfortable. So I think that's a really big one. Um, I think the second one um, that I would would spend some time on is, you know, obviously video is is uh, really kind of the also the darling of the the pandemic as we sit here on this webinar instead of being all together down in Westwood, and um, you know not only you know in terms of kind of Zoom, but think about what it's done for healthcare, and um, you know there were companies like Teladoc before. Um, who, you know, were, were doing actually a pretty good business with, you know, uh, you know, pretty good increases year over year in terms of, you know, telehealth appointments, um, you know, for certain kinds of conditions. But I think what, what at least I've seen, and I've actually experienced it, uh, you know, firsthand as I take care of some elderly folks in my family, um, you know, 100% of the visits are going online and it's becoming commonplace. Um, just the other day, we were talking with a, a group of doctors over at Stanford University and um, at Stanford Hospital, and, you know, almost all of, of the visits, just regular primary care visits or long-term, you know, chronic care visits, um, uh, they've all been moved to, to an online format. And so where there might have been concerns about people being on video before, um, you know, I think uh, I think that has has gone away, and people recognize that it can be quite an uh, effective and efficient way to meet people, um, and to to meet them anytime, you know, any place. Makes sense. Excellent, Peter. Your thoughts? Yeah, I'll just you know uh, echo a bit of what my my colleagues said. I'll try to add something new. Uh, uh, contactless transactions are falling at our universe squarely. Um, you know, we. We talk about in, in our in our world when we talk about identity and kind of the future of identity, we see you know your entire wallet going away, your driver's license, your credit card, you know everything you're carrying around with you today is really going to you know transfer into um, a, a digital identity and and how that works, how it is uh, handled safely, um, privately. Uh, and uh, helps to mitigate, you know, big, big costly issues like, you know, the cost of fraud and, and these kinds of things. That's, there's almost kind of a, uh, an urgency around that now, which is, which is really interesting and, and a lot of creative ideas are coming in. And we've had um, uh, the opportunity to talk to some, some uh, big organizations about that. So, so that's exciting. Um, retail too, and I think retail falls into kind of both categories. I think retail's got a real opportunity here for tremendous success. There are already companies who are thinking, you know, pretty creatively, uh, you know, everything from sort of a curbside pickup to, you know, lever leveraging uh, 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 some of the uh, delivery services. But, but also there's this, this collision that's been happening between kind of the physical world and the online world. Yeah. And, you know, we, we're, we're so uh, knowledgeable of, you know, logging into an Amazon or something and being able to shop online and all the information they have about us. But you walk into a brick, brick and mortar store and that engagement doesn't exist largely today. And we're, but we're seeing elements of that come uh, into, into retail. Amazon Go has, uh, is, is a, uh, is, is a, um, a store uh, concept that's already out there. And people are starting to see what that looks like, what that, what that uh, engagement looks like. And, and every retailer out there was already thinking about this pre-COVID. So uh, I, think, I think that's gonna accelerate. And just, I'll just shift gears a little bit. I think, you know, uh, on, a, on a challenging side, I think online education is, is undergoing a, a big challenge right now. I've got, you know, two teenagers at home, they're in high school and they're trying to do, you know, virtual classrooms. I think, it, you know, from my perspective, and I, I'm not an expert on this, but I think there's a real big struggle there. And I, I think schools are having a hard time figuring it out. I think it's, it's, it's rested squarely on the shoulders of teachers uh, in, in many cases. There is technology there. Um, but I just don't think it's replaced the classroom experience. And, and maybe that starts to occur, um, but I, I just, I haven't seen it yet. Um, and then lastly, I'll just leave you, we, we're also working on some government work and, and 
government continuity is a very, very big issue here. And as, uh, uh, as the pandemic uh, uh, became uh, uh, a huge issue for everybody, it, it exposed some of the weaknesses in our ability to sort of effectively govern um, at all levels of government, I, I think, by the way. And, and so there are, we, we've been pulled into some very interesting conversations about that as well. And, and uh, hopefully that gets figured out in a, in a, in a positive way here uh, too. Yep. Peter, let me drill down on a couple items that already ties into some of the questions from the audience that are coming in. So sure. face first, if I remember right, is basically a technology that allows somebody to enter a retail store, do uh, use facial recognition to uh, kind of understand who they are, their preferences, et cetera, with opt-in that creates a better retail experience. In an environment today, and let's assume it may go on a while, that people have got masks that are they're wearing how does something as basic as that change your your offerings yeah you're going to be surprised but i've heard this question a couple times uh, already um, yeah that's a that's a that's a big question in our industry of course and and you know um facial recognition and uh, uh, even our own brains are not very wired to recognize our friends who are wearing face masks. It can be kind of hard to recognize your friends even. So, so you know, when you're, when you're asking facial recognition to do it, you have some of the same challenges for sure. And uh, uh, we know this and we have dug into it, uh, you know, pretty, pretty deeply. Um, uh, I will tell you that um, there are sort of two things that go on when you try to um, use uh, an identity a tool like, like we have developed. Um, one of them is to detect a face, uh, to just understand that this is the, a, a face of a person. And that, that's relevant, not, we don't, are, we're not looking for the personal information of that person. We're not looking to know that it's you. But in this world today, we're looking for uh, compliance around social distancing. How many people are in a store right now? Because there's a limit to the number of people we can have in a store. Retailers refer to this as metering. They want to know how many have come in, how many have gone out and all that. And so the, that facial detection becomes very important for that. So we can just do sort of, you know, accounting, if you will. Um, the, the recognition part is the second part. Do we know who this person is um, if, if we want to, you know, be able to recognize that person? And, and yes, that's a challenge. We have made uh, you know, a number of very important upgrades to our algorithm in just a, a short period of time. We've seen great results out of it. Um, there is an impairment for sure. It's not perfect, um, but we have seen great results and we're going to keep working on it. I think we've got some ways to, to improve the accuracy in a, in a pretty meaningful way here. So we're, we're working with all of our customers on that right now. Good. Mark, one other question again related is there's a bunch of questions on commercial real estate. So we're talking about what industries and products are going to do well and which ones are not going to do well. And the question is commercial real estate, whether it be shopping malls or retailers, or we're going to get to, to Mark in a second, people working from home. Um, are you bearish on commercial real estate? Yeah, uh, you know, um... It, it's interesting. I think the way I would answer that question is, don't listen to me, go look at the data. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of data made available to you right now to help you answer these questions. Google produces these things called community location reports, mobile community report, reports. They, and they tell you where people are and how that's been trending uh, at aggregate levels. They use their tremendous amount of foot traffic data to show you know, how that's changing. And I think they track recreation, they track uh, foot traffic to workplaces and things. So whatever I say, you know, go, go fact check me, the data's out there. Um, I think from, from my particular experience, I think, um, you know, the, the landscape, I think, you know, there's always gonna be a market for the real estate. It's gonna be who, who's gonna own it? What are they gonna buy it and what are they gonna use it for? Uh, and I think, you know, for, for like my personal workplace, there's gonna be, we have a lot of flexibility. Uh, I, I, my, my, my belief is that I will be able to work from home if I choose to probably at least through the end of the year. And then maybe indefinitely, uh, because, you know, uh, I, I think there are reasons for people wanting to be back in the workplace, but the, the nature of my work is I probably, you know, I can be 80 to 90% as effective just working from home. And you know what? I love not having to commute. So that might be a benefit. Uh, obviously there's many other, uh, industries that won't be able to to do that. So maybe the question to ask is, what, 
what real estate is going to become available and then who are the potential purchasers. That's something I'm, you know, it's out of my wheelhouse. But I think, again, you can go look at the data and Google Trends and uh, the mobile community reports would be a great place to go start digging in. Yep, yep. And yeah. what are your view on that? Yeah, uh, Terry, I mean, I think, um, you know, one of the things I'd say is that, you know, in a, in a lot of areas, people are, are thinking about it in terms of, we used to do it face to face and and now what about doing things remotely and and I think in a lot of categories there's an opportunity for kind of a hybrid approach and um, you know uh, someone mentioned earlier kind of the the omni channel and for those who were really thinking about kind of the integration of physical and digital and that seamless experience are probably going to be you know some that had already sort of paved that way will be um, you know kind of poised uh, to benefit in kind of this this new normal as we go forward. And I think that that for those industries that maybe was operating in one or the other, this is an opportunity to really look at that that um, combination again. And particularly those areas where maybe it had been predominantly face to face, um, you know, how can you, you know, now um, still maintain some of that, but, you know, start to, to weave in on a more permanent basis or at least a, um, you know, trial basis. Uh, to see how, you know, remote can still be very effective. And so, you know, I think that it's, it's um, you know, something that, that will allow those environments, you know, like education, like Peter was talking about, where, you know, there's a lot of value in that social interaction and being at events. Um, in person, and how do you combine that with still this ability to then move some of your um, interactions, um, you know, to remote, and when you're comfortable enough that being remote doesn't seem to even um, phase somebody, but I think because it's still new to people and they haven't done it that way in the past, it's still kind of, um, you know, it's still kind of novel for them. So yeah. I would say, you know, it's it's going to be, um, you know, I actually think a sort of an opportunity to kind of reinvent how we engage. Yeah. So Lori, net net, are we as a nation and world oversupplied in office space and in retail? I understand the hybrid and you got to do a yeah. balance, but net net, do you have an oversupply environment? Because that means prices come down and you've got to repurpose that excess supply. Yeah, and I think, you know, and, and part of that reinvention is repurposing it and figuring out what, you know, how else do you use it versus the same way that you did office space in the past. Um, and uh, so, you know, definitely, I think there's opportunities to do that, but then it will also need to take into consideration a whole bunch of new factors, right, that not only is it um, some distancing that needs to happen, so it's not just taking the same office layouts and just spreading them six feet apart, but it's really, you know, how else can you engage in a way that still, um, you know, allows you to, to make use of that space. Um, uh, I think it's, and it's not just office space. I think we're going to see it in things like sports and entertainment as well. If you think about concerts or, you know, large football games, um, you know, both at, at, you know, kind of the college level and, and particularly professional level. I mean, there's going to be a lot of rethinking about how do you do this in a way that people still feel safe, um, you know, and follow the guidelines, but, but can still be, you know, part of, part of these experiences. Yep. So, Peter, let me ask you this now. So, basically, Mark and Lori have kind of painted a picture that there's a lot of kind of fundamental shifts that are going on, less retail in the traditional mode, less payments in the, in the traditional mode, less transportation in the original mode. If you're in an established business, if you're in real estate, if you're in transportation, if you're in hospitality, et cetera, what do you need to do right now? Well, I think we're in a, a, um, a phase of this era right now where we're, uh, you know, we're going to continue to operate in a, um, uh, an unusual and uh, new way for a period of time. But, but I think we will start to work our way out of this and, and transition to a different phase of this era as well. And, and what I mean by that is today, we're, uh, you know, we're on Zoom calls and we're not on airplanes and things like that. But I think a lot of commerce doesn't get done effectively without a face-to-face -face meeting. I think the importance of um, having, you know, sitting across the table from somebody and then maybe even taking them to dinner later and, and going and having, you know, building those, 
those those personal relationships is incredibly important to business and 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 how deals get done and so forth. So I think we're going to see a return to some of that. I don't think it's going to be at the levels that we saw before, but I think some of that is going to come back. So I agree, we're going to see you know downsizing of offices and things like that. But but uh, um, I, I think it's also revealed some new opportunities. Um, we uh, in our company we do. Uh, a weekly virtual lounge, and we get every single employee on a on a video call and have a chance to communicate with people, like we you know we we didn't do before. I, I wouldn't see everybody on a weekly basis for sure, um, and now we do, and and that's kind of nice. So there's some new things that I think are gonna are gonna are here to stay, uh, and hopefully, and and I think they're they're a benefit the organization and in, in, in ways we can communicate. Um, but I, I think we're going to, I think when we start to, to rebound, um, uh, things will come back, but they won't be anywhere near full scale for quite a while. And I, and I don't think we're going to see the rebound until two major factors occur. One is either there is a, a, an effective treatment where people feel comfortable that if they did get sick, that there would be a, a way to get treated and, and, uh, and the situation wouldn't be terribly dire. And of course, uh, if and when there is an effective vaccine, and I'm not the doctor, I don't, I don't know who the answer to that, but but I'm hopeful that 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 that, that comes around, and 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 that's really I think the X factor that many businesses are trying to solve for is when does that come about? When you know when can we safely put people back on airplanes? When can we return people to back to you know university campuses? When can you go back into a movie theater? All those questions um, are, you know, the, the, the when is the very hard part to answer. And, uh, and we're trying to, of course, balance health uh, with the economy and, frankly, people's sanity, too. I mean, I know there's a lot of cabinet fever going on, so it's, yeah. a, it's, it's a tricky balance. Good. Mark, you started out uh, very interestingly saying, you know, when I asked you what industries are favored and which ones aren't, et cetera, you talked about tech, tech, and tech is really net-net a good place to be in. You also said that large scale in general companies, large tech is good. So what is your recommendation and advice for the many people and industries that are not in that area, that are smaller companies, more traditional, et cetera? What would be from your experience at Google and at Snap, et cetera, what's your advice to, to others? Yeah, I think uh, adopting, like one of the things I'm, I'm concerned about in this, um, in this period of time is uh, not just all of the, the, the downside risks that we have, but also the, all of the opportunities that are going unrecognized right now. Uh, and I think in the, the, the world of large tech, I'm sort of used to this. I joke that I kind of have to find a new job for myself every nine to 12 months, uh, be it within Google or within a large tech company, because the technology that I'm working on by the time I launch it is al almost always obsolete. And so <laughs> I've got to go find another thing to do. Uh, that was certainly true at Google, and that's, that's uh, definitely true at Snap as well. But what that has forced me and the rest of the, the company and the organization, the culture of these companies to do is just accept that fact. The world is changing rapidly, and whatever you're building right now is, is probably going to be you know, obsolete fairly quickly. So how do you, how do you adapt to that quickly? Uh, and so you might have heard sort of the release and iterate uh, philosophy or the, the test and learn philosophy. And I think this is something that everyone can apply at any level of organization, wherever you are. Um, I think the idea that now, if you're, let's say you're, you're a small business that has been forced, you, you can't even get on the playing field right now because the government has shut you down, right? You're a restaurant or you're some other, a, a bar or nightclub or something, you've shut down. Now's a great time to be thinking about how do I hedge against this risk? What are the other things? What was, why do people come to my place? What core problem was I solving and how do I, why was I good at solving it? And then start from that user problem and then try to, you know, come up with some hypotheses that you can maybe test. It, that's going to be very difficult for, for some places. If you're a bar or nightclub, it's very difficult to, to test out what, you know, uh, a, a nightclub looks like in this world. Although I have heard of very successful virtual nightclubs starting up, uh, targeting the, the single population that, um, you know, I work with a lot of singles, and so they, you know, it's the buzz uh, at at our uh, at our site, and they're starting to build brands. And so I think you're starting to see that actually a nightclub might actually become something like, uh, you know, an event company, 
uh, if you do it right. Because what you're good at is a promotion. You're, you're good at promoting, getting people excited about coming to this place, creating exclusivity and, and selectivity. So I, I think um, adopting that test and learn attitude uh, and I think the mentality that uh, this obstacle, in this obstacle, you will find opportunity if you look for it um, is a really important thing. And then I mentioned to this before, but I think also be aware of all the assets that are available to you. One of the things that Snapchat is working very hard to do, and I think a lot of the other tech companies are, are being asked to do right now and, and trying to work, is, work on is helping people make sense of this. Because there's so much data flowing through these services, uh, we're in, in many ways a uniquely positioned to understand what's about to happen before most others because we have the data. Uh, and many of these companies are making this data freely available to you and have for a long time. So again, Google Trends is a great place to go. If you haven't played around with that, you can see trending search terms. I learned that maybe there's there's hope for a vaccine in llama blood today by looking at that. Uh, maybe you knew about that. I, I did not. Uh, but uh, I think Google Trends is a good place to look. Also, Pinterest uh, publishes these interest reports. And you can kind of think the way people use Pinterest, they go there to post and look at uh, things that they're dreaming of a, a lot. It's kind of what, what I want. Uh, and you can kind of see what's happening there. Um, so, you know, adopt, test and learn, look at the data you have, and then start testing those hypotheses. Yep, excellent. Lori, let me ask, a, there's a series of questions actually from some of my current and former students here, which is okay. terrific. Pranav has asked, as leaders, how do you see uh, team dynamics changing in an increasingly virtual world. How can you keep people motivated, well-connected, focused? So you're obviously experiencing this at Anderson in a virtual mode, and you've probably experienced it in an enterprise mode. What, what's your thought on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's a good question. A lot of people are asking this, you know, companies of, of really kind of any size, any vertical. And, um, you know, I think um, if, you, if you look at sort of the old ways of, you know, being in, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of industries where it, people were going into the office, that meant that they were, you know, people felt like that was when they were working, right? And there was FaceTime. And I think in recent years, particularly led by a lot of the tech companies, we've seen a move to, you know, kind of work anywhere, um, you know, unlimited, you know, day, days out of the office for whatever reason, just, you know, kind of, uh, you know, let people know. But there was also then this undercurrent of always on. And so, you know, I think one of the things that this um, sort of pandemic introduces, companies that weren't used to maybe having um, some of those people remote is getting comfortable that when people are not just, you know, uh, someone you can walk by or sitting in front of you, it does not mean that they're not working. Um, I think the other is the recognition that, um, you know, people have lives and really getting a view into, you know, sort of who they are as people. So a lot more empathy is, I think, kind of coming into the mix, um, understanding and, um, you know, and really, you know, trying to get to know people as people. Um, you know, related to that, I'll mention, you know, one of the other big trends um, that has been happening is, is kind of a subcategory of health and wellness. Um, is around sleep. And there's been a lot of studies um, done about the importance of sleep. And again, you know, you think about teams and teams were all about everyone has to be there every time, always available. And, um, you know, now there's, you know, a lot of good, um, you know, quantitative data that shows, you know, getting seven or, hour, seven or more hours of sleep you know, adds 3% to GDP, right? I mean, it, it matters, um, you know, to companies all over, um, you know, the world in different industries. And so there's a whole sleep economy that's worth over $400 billion at this point alone, connected to IoT devices, apps like Calm, um, you know, uh, businesses like Casper that really focus on getting to that wellness. And so I think for teams, it's really recognizing that, you know, right now there's not a huge separation between kind of, um, you know, when you're always on, what's personal and what's professional. And so really trying to have a recognition of, you know, when is it that you really need to kind of all be meeting as a team? And then what are those things that can be done in more smaller groups or offline or asynchronous, um, you know, that are still effective ways of getting business done? Excellent, excellent. Peter, on a related note, one of the questions uh, came up about what value can Anderson MBAs 
kind of serve in this environment? I assume it's a current student here. What is your advice about how to kind of position yourself as an MBA? Well, you know, uh, there, uh, th there is a, um, I think a real a huge opportunity for businesses to be rethinking how they're doing business. Um, deploying technology, building technology, interacting with their customers. And, and I think that the, that opportunity probably could be, you know, best leveraged by uh, having some fresh, you know, minds in, in an organization. I think, um, you know, uh, if, if uh, you know, Terry, you and I have talked about uh, uh, folks that have been out of school for 10 years, 15 years, um, who, you know, desire to understand what's going on with artificial intelligence and um, machine learning and you know some of the you know new ways and new to new tools that are available to businesses today it can be tough to navigate uh, and and I, I think Anderson can be helpful there as well but um, but as you've got you know new new grads and recent uh, uh, alums out in the marketplace th th there's an opportunity for them to help businesses in a in a, a really fresh way and and, and also, I think, you know, we're, as we're going through this extremely dynamic time and, uh, you know, we're you know, literally questioning everything, uh, how our customers, uh, how our customers are thinking about their own end customers and, and how they're going to work with them and engage with them better and provide a better service, um, and, but both for the, for the fact of, uh, you know, for the, for the effort of survival and uh, for their own competitive advantage. And, and I think um, adding, uh, you know, MBA um, uh, uh, academics to that, uh, that equation can be extremely helpful. Good. And Peter, just to follow on on that, in terms of what do you do to stay current? What would your advice be? What do you read, podcasts, websites, all that stuff? What would you recommend? Boy, it's, it's, it's information overload out there, but... But there are, you know, there are a number of good news sources that um, uh, synthesize data quite nicely. And so I, I look for those things. I, I um, uh, broadly look across business and tech. Um, and so I, I rely on everything from, uh, you know, Marketplace Radio uh, to the Wall Street Journal. Uh, um, uh, there are some, some great, you know, podcasts out there as well. But also I, I take a lot of time to make sure that I'm talking to uh, my customers and I'm talking to my salespeople and the people that are kind of on the front line of my company. Those are the people that are hearing kind of the day-to-day -day pains and problems and gee, if we could only solve this, if we only had a way to do you know, this, those, those kinds of conversations are great because we can bring what's possible to that, to that conversation. And together we can kind of come up with some good ways to solve problems. And, and I think, again, today is just the silver lining here is that there's never been quite a time like this before where you could actually do that. I mean, contactless transactions, it's come up a, num a number of times that, uh, you know, th there is something that's absolutely gonna get solved here soon. There's no one way to solve it, but it's absolutely gonna get solved. People don't wanna touch pin pads anymore. People don't wanna be handing credit cards over to people. Um, you know, all, all of that. Um, and I think, uh, you know, now's the time that we're going we're gonna to start to see that change. And, and, and so, to, you know, how does that change? You know, you've you got to have those conversations uh, uh, directly with the, with the frontline people. So um, a, a number of different sources. Excellent. Excellent. Mark, question from you from one of my current students, Ariel. From a leadership perspective, how do you educate yourself to anticipate the next um, down the road. You've talked about this kind of agility and all that, and the ability to kind of see into the future. How do you actually do that uh, tactically? You can't. <laughs> all you can do is, is try to discover it a little bit before everyone else. And, and I think if you take a good, if you take a structured approach to problem solving, you realize that I think um, there are some things you can look at data. If you're really smart about it, you can start to see trends like a little bit before other people do. But understanding like what Peter was saying, how do you solve that problem? The, the, the first issue is identifying the user problem. And then the second is uh, of the many solutions, and there are always many, uh, which is the one that is actually going to be the one, the, the best one for that client that you're positioned to build. And so one of the things that I teach in my class uh, is, is the sprint process, the design sprint process. You may have heard of design thinking 
and mm -hmm. uh, it may be a bad buzzword to you, but to me, it's been um, just a, a tremendous source of innovation. You should think of it as a step-by-step -step guide for how to manufacture creativity <laughs> and how to test and validate quickly. Uh, so a book that I, that I teach in my class uh, is, is called Sprint. You can look for a Sprint book. They give you a five-day uh, Sprint process. It's, it was uh, invented over at uh, Google Ventures and it's used by many companies. Um, but, uh, you know, it's just a, it's a tool. Ours included. And, what's that? Ours included. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's, it's fast becoming, and I'd love to hear Peter talk a little bit about how he uses it, but it's fast becoming, uh, you know, a standardized way to, to sort of approach these problems. And again, discover the future a little bit before everyone else. It's not about predicting it necessarily. Okay, and Mark, related question, I think maybe you've answered some of this, but what strategies and approaches to product management still work after all these years? What doesn't work? Yeah, after all these years, you know, product management didn't exist in tech, it barely existed when I, when I graduated. So it does, it, it hurts a little bit to hear all these years, but it's true. Uh, yeah, I would say, you know, when, when I graduated, when I first got into product management at Google, the, these concepts, the idea of sprinting and design thinking were still relatively new and, and hadn't been sort of institutionalized. Uh, but what you're starting to see at uh, the, more, the more innovative companies, the ones that have sort of adopted that as their main culture. So I'll go back to that point. And I think, you know, Peter, living proof that innovation happens when you use sprints and so forth. But, uh, uh, you know, I think um, look at that process and you'll see that there's just a whole lot of tools for, for how to break down that very fuzzy question of what should we build next? What should we do next? Um, th there's ways you can tackle that problem that make it much less scary and much more tractable. Okay, great. Lori, a couple of questions for you um, related to kind of payments, cash, et cetera. First question from Sarah is, do you think cash is fully on its way out? Number one. Um, number two, Patrick Ryan, one of the former speakers in my class uh, at Google. Um, what, is, uh, what are you seeing in fintech related to COVID? And do you think this is an opportunity for cryptocurrency to kind of re-accelerate? Yeah, okay. Uh, so let me take the first one, you know, related to cash. Um, you, know, uh, you know, many of us um, that have been in the industry a long time, I mean, our entire focus is, um, uh, and, and I should say in terms of, you know, elect, uh, electronic payments, uh, our focus has been uh, the key competition is cash, uh, cash and check, predominantly cash. Uh, around the world, cash still makes up over 80, 85 percent of, of the payments um, around the world. And um, although in the United States we are heavily carded or uh, electronic, uh, electronified market, um, you know, still have cash operating, um, particularly in certain segments like small uh, payments under $20, you know, a significant amount of time. It's still the most used form of payment um, even here in the U.S. And so what, what things like um, the, the pandemic do is that they highlight areas such as, um, you know, not only, you know, we always talk about payments being, you know, are they, are they um, safe and secure? Are they, you know, easy and convenient? And can you, you know, do a, a you know, a fast transaction? But now we're saying it's also the, the healthiest transaction, right? And even, even the, the World Health Organization is talking about this and the virus, you know, can't be spread if you're not exchanging uh, you know, the, the money, um, you know, hand to hand. So there's a definitely sort of a health opportunity for this. And I think, again, if we go look at what happened in China from almost, a, you know, two decades ago, you can see that they accelerated this push to move off cash. Um, do I think that it's going to create acceleration? Um, I, definitely, I think we're already seeing that. And a lot of these um, uh, things have already been in process for many, many decades. Um, but uh, do I think it's going away? No, I don't think it's going away yet. And I do think that, you know, you still have some economies around the world that are operating at, you know, 90, 95% plus in cash, right? They're really fully cash markets. And until you can get those people who are either unbanked or underbanked into the formal financial system, um, it will be very difficult for them to have another way of doing an exchange of value. Mm -hmm. So there's an opportunity here, but not going away. The, the second one you asked was, you know, what's the role of kind of fintech in this? And fintech has been playing, I think, a, a pretty big role, not only just the, the, the contactless piece that we've talked about, but e-commerce 
And we've touched on that, but really, I mean, e-commerce has been growing in double digit rates for over the past decade. And what we're seeing is a mass move um, into e-commerce or mobile commerce type transactions. And many of those are, you know, directly to buy something online, have them delivered to you in sort of the traditional e-commerce. But I think the other we're seeing is this connection uh, to the physical world, which is happening in the way of, um, you know, buy online and go pick up at, at the store or do the curbside delivery. And if you take a look at the trends in the most recent quarter, uh, that's what's helping drive that e-commerce volume, which is actually up almost 20% uh, from the major networks in the last quarter. And I think we're going to continue to see that acceleration, you know, as people get more comfortable, um, you know, with with the the methods of, of buying goods and services, uh, goods and, and uh, other retail items this way. But I think the other is making sure that you have all the infrastructure around it, right? So, it, you know, it, the uh, companies, good role model companies here are folks like Target and Walmart. You know, they have been investing in uh, Walmart site to store for, you know, almost, uh, I don't know how many years it's been, but I think it's been, you know, close to almost a decade. Um, uh, Target's done significant um, uh, um, work in the side of car uh, curbside and how they not only connect that to um, you know, the ability to offer that service and to do that online shopping, but you have to then connect it to your fulfillment and, um, you know, all the, the supply chain that goes behind that. So, um, you know, if the infrastructure hadn't been started many years ago, they probably wouldn't have been able to pivot as fast as they did this last, you know, six to, to 10 weeks. Yep. Um, so I think that's a big piece of it. The other is that a lot of, um, uh, the loans that are being processed, the PPP loans, are being managed by um, fintech companies, both challenger banks, neo banks, um, and then you're also seeing, in some cases, there's a in one of the neo uh, uh, sort of neo banks, a company called Chime, also went further um, in terms of the um, $1,200 stimulus checks that the government was providing to individuals they made an offer out to their customers to say that we will provide you an advance check on that money. So we will, we will issue an advance even before the government can issue those checks mm -hmm. as a way to drive that volume. So I think you're seeing a lot of involvement from FinTech in different ways. And, and again, it starts with that sort of acknowledgement of where are we now, but I think many of them have been able to pivot quite quickly um, you know, to address the, the current situation. The question will be, you know, um, how, how trusted they are and, you know, which ones will survive. Um, because I think there's a lot of folks out there trying. It's a big uh, market opportunity. Um, but, you know, in, in a situation like the pandemic and when people are strapped for cash, they're really going to go to those providers that they trust, and particularly when it deals with financial services. So I think what we're going to see is we're going to see, you know, either a number of them combining uh, or we're going to see, you know, um, a few of them really kind of skyrocket, you know, in this, um, you know, sort of in this environment to be kind of the next set of, of darling companies. So I think that's the second one. And the third question you asked me was around, uh, was it crypto? Yeah, it was crypto. Yeah. Although okay. we just have a couple minutes left here. So do you have like a 10 yeah. second view on crypto? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, my, I guess my, my view on that is, um, I think there's a lot of volatility in, in the crypto now, and there's probably a, a big move into more secure uh, levels of it. But when you talk about cash, and um, people wanting more digital forms, um, you know, definitely, there may be some opportunities for it. Personally, I think the bigger opportunity is with the technology of blockchain. Um, and a lot of the things that blockchain can do as it relates to, you know, payments, risk management, and also supply chain management, uh, you know, and, and really hitting the tipping point with some of those use cases. Great. So listen, in the last couple minutes we've got, I'd like to give my brief takeaways that I took from the three of you. And I want to give each of you 30 seconds each to either upgrade what I share or give your own advice. One of the two. So I've got four takeaways that I got from uh, uh, this evening, which has been super helpful. First one is with COVID-19, there's been an acceleration of outcomes for companies, either an acceleration of good things or the acceleration of their demise. 
Second comment I have is the role of technology in this current environment has actually been upweighted. Whether it's uh, contactless technologies, the use of video conferencing, mobile wallets, last mile delivery, whatever the technology is, that there's been a, an increase of the importance of those. A third piece I've got is about thinking about agility and how you work and how you think. That this environment requires a different way of operating, compression of cycles, uh, et cetera. And then the fourth one is understanding how do you work in this virtual environment so that there's a respect of people's lives, of their work, of getting the engagement you want, et cetera, that if this is gonna go on for a while, you're gonna have to be really good as leaders in that. So let me give each of you 30 seconds or less to give me your, uh, your thoughts on, uh, on that, or if you have closing advice for, uh, for, uh, for everybody. Mark, you wanna start? You nailed it. I just say, uh, continue to look for the opportunity in this obstacle. Excellent. Thank you. Peter? Yeah, I think, I think you're, you're spot on, Terry. You know, I, I would uh, just say that I think it's, um, uh, th there's probably a, an opportunity here to um, take a realistic, you know, uh, inventory of, of uh, uh, yourself, your business, uh, things around you, and, um, and, and try to, you know, be uh, eyes wide open about, about what's going on and, and be willing to be flexible and, and adapt. I, I think uh, adapting and, and survivability right now is really important. Perfect. Lori? Yeah, I, I also think you, you nailed it. I would just say, you know, um, don't, don't forget the fundamentals. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of opportunity with new technologies, um, but I would always start with grounding yourself with, uh, as, as Mark said it very eloquently, you know, what problem are you trying to solve? Um, and really understand the use cases and then look to technologies to be your enable, enablers to really provide you that competitive advantage, right? Don't just go to technology for technology's sake. Mm -hmm. um, and, and keep in mind that, you know, some of the, 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 the most simplest things are, are really the best ideas, right? It doesn't need to be complex. Wonderful. Listen, let me just say a couple of thank yous um, here. First of all, most importantly, Lori, Mark, and Peter, excellent, excellent insights. In, a, in one hour's time, looking at this landscape, making sense of it and giving good advice to current students, alums, et cetera, hugely uh, uh, beneficial. Let me thank again, Office of Alumni Relations, the UCLA Anderson Alumni Network. They are terrific, terrific partners. And let me thank the audience, the number of questions we got, the engagement on this. Uh, you make me proud to be a, a Bruin. Thank you guys all very much. And we'll look forward to seeing you again very soon. Take care. Great, thanks. Thank you.